People reach new understandings all the time. They take a second look and maybe change their minds. People reach new understandings every day. Tell me not to reach and I'll go away. Thank you. Thank you. So we are blessed to be here on this beautiful day, this beautiful place, this beautiful community. I've been reflecting of late about my life and the life of this center and therefore your lives and thinking about how easy it is to get distracted. A while back I gave a talk about the law of attraction or the law of distraction. And they're equally the same. Sometimes we allow ourselves to get distracted. But what we know, if you listened to last week's talk, is what we focus on, we find. And so when we allow ourselves to be distracted, then all kinds of mayhem ensues. So there's a wonderful practice, a spiritual practice, that helps us to stay centered and selfless, to stay focused. And it's called the practice of gratitude. You see, gratitude is not an experience, I believe, but rather a practice. It's as important to our spiritual growth and awareness as is our prayer, as is our meditation, to really be in that state of thanksgiving about the many blessings in our lives. Thomas Merton, great Christian mystic, wrote... He said, gratitude therefore takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive, is, con is constantly awakening to new wonder and to praise of the goodness of God. See, there's a way of being in the world that sees life in its fullness. One of the things that I have concern about is that we live in a society that makes it very easy to move into that state of not enoughness. Because we have so much available. We have so much available to us that when we have a 10,000 square foot home, there's a 20,000 square foot home just down the street that looks so much more attractive. Or whatever, I'm just... You know, that we can always, there's always a new, bigger, better, improved, faster, smarter version of what's available to us. And so if we are not careful, we find ourselves always in a state of longing for that new, something better, faster model. Some of you are thinking I'm talking about your spouse. I am not. <laughs> I am, <laughs> I'm speaking about stuff here, okay, just so we're clear. <laughs> Although, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hate to limit any possibilities, right? <laughs> so I was reminded of a wonderful story that Alan Cohen talks about. And he was on a, having a day with his goddaughter, wonderful little 10 year old girl. And so, you know, goddaughters are like nieces and nephews, they're really fun. You get to hang out with them, and you get to then drop them off when you're done. <laughs> Grandkids, you know. Um, and so he was um, with this little girl, and they had a wonderful time. And he knew that the family had moved, but he really didn't know where. And so after they had their day at the mall and did whatever you do with 10-year-old girls, and um, they just had a joyous and wonderful time. Got, I'm sure they got frozen yogurt and the whole deal. And then he took his goddaughter home. And so as he was pulling up into this field, he realized that the new home that they were living in was basically a very rusty old bus that had been converted to some kind of living situation. And so he was struck, realizing, oh my God, they've obviously fallen on very hard times, trying to you know, keep the poker face going and be cheerful, but he was like, oh my God. 
And so in this experience, he was like, wow, okay. So, you know, but he's not saying that to the kid. So they go and pulls up and drop her off. And she says, do you want to come see my room? <laughs> sure, of course. And so he went inside and the, the uh, outside, inside of the bus was very reflective of the outside of the bus. Uh, there was a keeping, there was a theme that ran through the entire experience. Um, <laughs> a theme for decor called run down and kind of scary. And so he's into his whole thing about, oh my goodness, and whatever and whatever. And she says, so let me show you my room. And so in the back of this bus, there was an added on room that was kind of dilapidated except, itself, except that he noticed out of the corner of his eye, this beautiful tapestry hanging against one wall. And he finally said to the little girl, he says, so how do you like, how do you like living here? She said, I love my wall. You see, from the mouth of babes, she didn't see what was missing. She saw what was real and what was beautiful. And so he walked away from that experience a changed person because he realized even with all of his spiritual work, that sometimes he was allowing himself to focus on the not, on the not enough, on what was wrong, on how it should be. And yet this child didn't see all that. She saw that she had a shelter, she saw that she had loving family, and she saw that she had an amazing wall to look at. So what we begin to understand is that we are all at choice in every moment. We are all perceiving reality. And sometimes when we forget, we allow ourselves to look at what is missing. I believe that Jesus was trying to help us to understand that there is a way of living in the world that is filled and overflowing with love and grace and fullness and in truth with abundance. But he said, there's a catch. If you read the fine print, he said, you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear, meaning we have to develop a sense of spiritual discernment that allows us to move beyond the appearance of things, beyond our judgment of how things should be, how they should look, how everyone should act, to see what is in front of us. As Byron Katie says, for us to learn to love what is. When our hearts are filled and overflowing, we move into a higher dimension of being. And then we see the beauty and the good and the truth and the love. You see, he, um, Alan Cohen said, we must evaluate our experiences in a totally new way. We must refuse to see our sorrows, our hurts, and our conflicts only at the surface level. We must be willing to look deeper. There is no wasted time or purposeless experience. No wasted time or purposeless experience. We take the challenges that now face us and rework them in our minds until we see them in a positive light. Until they come into that light, they are begging for our awareness. And as soon as we give it to them, they become golden. I've often shared my story of how I ended up in ministry, which is a path that was not on my agenda. (laughs) I've gone back and checked. (laughs) My ninth grade goal setting class, nowhere ever did it ever, ever, ever say anything that referred reflected church, ministry, minister, spiritual stuff. And yet, life continues to happen. But the catalyst for that experience was when I was 23 years old, my best friend and boyfriend died. 23 years old, killed in a car accident. And I remember so well that I had taken, this was in Phoenix, and I had taken the summer, I was going to go up to 
Denver cool off a little bit in the mountains and uh, work and do some things. And, and when I left, I remember the last thing I said to him was, see you later. And I never did. Now, at that time, I had no skills, what we would now refer to as life skills. I did not know how to process this weird thing that was happening inside of me, which apparently are called emotions. <laughs> Up until that time, I didn't do that, right? And so I um, did some things that people do when they're in grief and don't know how to deal with their grief. They were not what we'd call particularly positive or effective. Um, did get my attention. And I decided at some point I needed to learn how to do something differently. So, so I like to say it wasn't like I had this experience and said, oh, I'll go to a center for spiritual living and learn how to be a healthy, productive person. Oh, no, no, no. I had to spend, I took a little drive through crazy town. <laughs> in fact, I actually stopped and camped out in crazy town for a while. <laughs> Discovered Crazy Town is not such a great place to live. Fun to visit, but not a great place to live. And so discovered that I had to learn how to do something differently. I had to approach this thing called life differently. And so I, sure enough, again, not going to go to church because that, just crazy people do that. And so I did go sign up for a class that was very helpful, very positive mental attitude, becoming an effective speaker. And, and in that class, met a gal who invited me to come to this center that she went to. Center was a little more appealing than church, so I said, what's it going to hurt? Some part of me said, go, get her off your back, and you can be done, right? And then you can go back to your nice secular life that's working so darn well. Um, <laughs> And so I walked into a center not um, that different from this center. People just hugging each other for no apparent reason. <laughs> just hugging each other. Like they knew each other or something. They were hugging and they were laughing and clapping. And I mean, this was in a church setting. And, you know, as a good Southern Baptist, this was, I don't think so. Right? But they seemed to be having fun and, and the message kind of made sense. And before I knew it, I was sort of tapping my toe. And before I knew it, I just hugged somebody because they said, let's hug everybody. And so, you know, began my journey of hugged them, right? <laughs> so sure enough, I began to study and I began to take some of these classes and I began to realize that I could deal with my mind differently if I would also deal with my emotions differently, which implied that I needed to listen to those emotions. You see, grief is a very powerful, transformative agent in our lives. But it takes some wisdom to learn how to grieve gracefully. So in that process, I began a journey that culminates with today. I don't know what's next, but today I'm here, right? Took me around the country, 25 years of ministry, how did that happen? Now, I don't think Billy died so that I could go into ministry. That's a very limited way of thinking about it. But that circumstance happened. And out of that circumstance, I made choices. Initially, I made very self-destructive choices. But that propelled me into a new way of being, which propelled me into an experience, which brought me into a community that helped me discover the truth of who I am and helped me live more powerfully in the world. And turns out I could teach others. Who knew? It's a crazy town, new crazy town. I was thinking about Terry Garr. Many of you know Terry Garr, wonderful actress. She was nominated for an Academy Award in uh, her supporting role in Tootsie. Very bright, funny, full of life, charismatic person. And so she had all a number of roles and just very fun and full of life, and everybody loved her. And, um, and then in October of 2002, she announced publicly 
that she was dealing with a condition called multiple sclerosis. And so one might look at that, which if you've seen her recently, she's looked very different. It's kind of sad to watch that degenerative process happen through her body. And so one might be tempted to say, ain't it awful? Isn't that a shame? But she said something very powerfully. She said, I'm telling my story because I want to help people. I want people to know they're not alone, and I want to tell them there are reasons to be optimistic because today treatment options are available. But here's what struck me in this statement. She said, when you hear the word disabled, people immediately think about people who can't walk or talk or do everything that people take for granted. I take nothing for granted. But I find the real disability is people who can't find joy in life and who are bitter. So, snap, 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 girl, right? (laughs) And I've seen that sometimes with people who are differently abled. That we might say, oh, and yet they might look at us and say, hey, I'm only physically different. (laughs) You, my friend, are a mess. No, I don't know that they would say that to you, but they might think it. When I was in the school of ministry many years ago, me, a person who was not going to become a minister, who then moved to L.A. to become one, a place I said I'd never live, by the way, Never live in L.A. You know, I've said this many times, but I'm pretty well convinced that every time you say never, it's like placing a bullseye on your back for God. (laughs) It's like, really? God's saying, really? You think so? Hmm. Let's just see what happens here, right? So let us not be so resistant to things is the lesson. But I moved to, um, to Los Angeles to having pursued this grand idea that I would become a minister, that I would share my story and help others find the truth and the light within them. That involved many changes. And so at one point, I just simply surrendered to the process, let go of my comfortable life, and said, all right. Uh, Jesus said it very eloquently, Um, when he said, not my will, but thine be done. I said it less eloquently when I was like, not my plan. (laughs) Later I said, but what the heck, you know? (laughs) But for many years it was just not my plan and I was not happy about it. But what are you going to do? So I find myself in Los Angeles. I'm going to school. I'm learning. And then they moved our school to Huntington Beach. So I'm working downtown L.A., commuting to Huntington Beach four nights a week to take classes, which is an exercise in peacefulness in itself, because if you've ever done the 405 or the 5 at (laughs) 5 o'clock in the afternoon, (laughs) you find your inner ohm. (laughs) Or you're in a road rage and you hurt people. So I chose to be an enlightened soul, but it was a wonderful experience. And in that, I got to have this another one experience because at that time, the Huntington Beach Center for Spiritual Living was this amazing center. It was one of our top organizations, 3,000 people on a Sunday. They started in this little shopping center, and by the time this thing was at its height, it was half of the shopping center. They had this amazing bookstore that was selling $50,000 in product every month. I mean, it was a going thing. And at the head of this organization was Dr. Peggy Bassett, who was one of the most powerful, amazing women I've ever been privileged to know. And Peggy was not a particularly eloquent speaker. It wasn't that she was so gifted in her way of speaking as it was in her presence that you could not help but feel the energy. And I remember one time being there at the center and walking by the sanctuary just as it was letting out, and they opened the doors, and I literally felt 
as this blast of energy had just shot out of the room. It was an amazing thing to experience. Now, as I said, Peggy wasn't an amazingly gifted speaker, but she was a powerful speaker. She was a powerful presence. She was a tall woman. And she came out of a background of her story was that she had actually been in an abusive relationship where her ex had almost killed her. That's where she started. So I, I always marvel at that because here was this beaten down, wounded woman who, when she figured out who she was and transmuted that message into being a powerful force in the world, created a community that was amazing and dynamic and so instrumental to so many others moving on and following their dream and their heart and their possibility. You think, well, how is that possible? I don't know how that's possible. Except that when we stop believing in our littleness and when we stop thinking that we somehow deserve to be treated less than a divine child of the infinite, when we stop arguing for our limitation, when we stop being small and surrender to a greater something that's trying to happen through us, then all things become possible for us. And so here was this woman who almost died at the hands of an abuser who became a powerful force. She was the president of our entire organization. I mean, she was it. And then as she was getting older, she began to experience a degenerative disease, a degenerative nerve disorder. It began by affecting her hands and her feet first, but eventually it began to affect her tongue and her throat. Now, when you're a minister, as I always like to say, I get paid by the minute. I mean, by the word. So in case you ever wonder why he goes on and on, so, you know, I'm getting paid by the word. I'm going to make it, you know, I'm going to make it worth my time to be here. But when you are paid to give a message and you're no longer able to give the message, now what? So the practitioners, and there was a couple of hundred of them by that time, were all like, we got to get together. we got to have a physical healing. Right? We're going to know the spiritual truth. We're going to cast out the demons. We're going to do whatever we need to do so that she can experience full physical health. But Dr. Peggy Bassett was an amazingly wise woman, grounded in spirit. She said, I want to remember one time, as things were getting progressive, she said, you know, all my life, all my adult life, I have made my living by using my words, conveying my message through the words that I speak. Now I get to convey my message through my being. The most powerful talks that I heard her give were in that last year or so, when she was less reliant on her vessel and fully reliant on her being. It was an amazing thing to experience. But when the practitioners all got together and said, we must pray for you, she said, listen, I appreciate your love and support, but don't pray for my physical healing. She said, what I would like to invite you, pray with me that I receive the wisdom of this experience. You see, this is a wise soul that's saying, I don't have to have all of the conditions in my life to be lined up, to be organized, to be just the way I want them to realize the fullness of my life. Rather, I'm choosing to experience the fullness of my life because the fullness of my life is within me. Jesus spoke to this when he said, let us enter into this kingdom which was his way of saying into this higher dimension of living that can see beyond the appearance of things to appreciate the fullness of life. But as he said, you must have eyes to see and ears to hear that we might experience this, which is to say we have to move beyond the limitation of the five senses. There's a reality that is transcendent of all of this stuff. When we understand that, then we can find peace. 
then we can find awareness, then we can find understanding. I'm not standing here saying sad things aren't happening. I'm not saying that bad things aren't happening, but I am saying there is a way of being in the world through spiritual practice and discipline that allows us to be at peace and to see a higher order of things. And when we can see the higher order of things, we can live from that state of consciousness and then we move into action to bring forth a greater good. You see, this little girl said, I love my wall. She didn't see what was wrong. She saw a beautiful tapestry in her bedroom. So beautiful, in fact, she wanted to invite her friend to come see it. Now, thank God he had the wisdom to just listen to what this child was saying. What I know what I believe is that our fear sees the limits. Our fear sees the limitation. Think about it. When you move into a fearful state, you can be paying the same bills. If you're in a fearful state, oh my God, can the creative imagination go crazy, right? Take your right to homeless in about that much time. Or you can be in a loving state. Because love sees possibilities. I was thinking about this the other day, and I was just thinking as I was paying bills, I was like, you know, I'm going to send a blessing with every one of these. Like, thank you, electric company. When it's 32 degrees outside, thank you, electric company. Thank you for giving me this. And they give you the electricity first. (laughs) Well, thank you, right? They don't say, send us a check and we'll turn it on. They're like, we'll give it to you. People will give you a whole car. (laughs) Like, take the car, drive it away. Just send us a check every once in a while. Preferably every month on time, but you know, at least every once in a while, right? Wow. Fear sees limits. Love sees possibility. Love sees abundance. And gratitude is the transformative force. To gratitude, my friend Diane Harmony says, gratitude is the distiller of motion, emotions. When you are giving thanks, you are, uh, you are purifying your emotional response to life. You are purifying your emotional response to life. She says, Gra- gratitude is the great multiplier. As we've talked about, what we focus on increases. And so when we allow ourselves to be in that limited, fearful state, if that's our focus, it also becomes our experience. Good news. If we have the wisdom and the insight to realize that we're a choice at every moment and that we choose love and we choose gratitude, and that's where we allow our focus, then it creates an expansive way of being that greater good can be realized. It, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get my Bible out. <laughs> I was, someday I'm going to do that. You, you guys are going to do it. Oh my God. <laughs> but not today. I always have this little, a friend of mine sent me a card some time ago and it sits on my little bulletin board, and I just saw it again. I see it from time to time. Brew Joy said this, we are beings in a school for gods in which we learn in slow motion the consequences of thought. We are beings in a school for gods in which we learn in slow motion the consequences of thought. What I also know is that as we become more aware, as we become more practiced, as we become more skilled, we see how quickly that motion moves up. Some of us, when we started this journey, we really had to effort our way into positive thinking. (laughs) Some of you are still there. (laughs) And then we had evidence eventually that 
kind of reflected like, hey, some things are changing. Maybe I'll keep doing that. Now some of us are profoundly aware of the thing that we think and the word that we speak can show up like that. And when you get that, you want to be very mindful. So life is good. We are blessed. My invitation for you is take nothing for granted. We never know how many moments determine our life. We never know the people in our lives who may not be here tomorrow. We, may, we never know exactly what the next step looks like. So we would be wise and wonderful to appreciate what is. I was reminded of this. We had a family reunion back in July and a bunch of us got together and just hung out. And, you know, I love my family and they love me. And we are far from perfect. We're all unique individuals. I always like to say we put the fun in dysfunction. So, you know, <laughs> we're just like every other family, right? Just. But somebody was visiting us and came and, and said to me after my, he said, I'm so struck by how you guys are with each other. So what do you mean? He said, every time anybody leaves, they say, I love you. I mean, this is like to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Goodbye, I love you. I said, I've never quite experienced, it's like, I said, well, you know, we all lost my dad and my sister on the same day. It kind of, I mean, we were already kind of into it, but it was that like, you know, this may be the moment to tell them. I'm gonna suggest to you, as we are in this time of, of gratitude and thanksgiving, don't let the moment pass. Take nothing for granted. Tell the people you love that you love them. Right? There's a prayer that I'd like to end with. It comes from Psalm 111. Again, if you'd like to open your Bibles. Um, <laughs> however, it would do you no good to open your uh, King James Version because this one's translated by Stephen Mitchell. And Stephen Mitchell is just a brilliant, brilliant soul who brings life to many different scriptures. And he's done a whole thing on Psalms, on uh, interpreted. So I'd like to invite you. Now, he does continue to use the male masculine reference to God. Put in she if you like, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but hear this. I invite you just to open your heart, to close your eyes, and then we'll go right into prayer. Psalm 111. I thank God with all my heart for the gifts he has given human, humankind. Uncountable are his miracles. Immeasurable his love. He has formed us in his own image and kindles his truth in our minds. He has filled us each day with his splendor and given us eyes to see hearts that can comprehend, spirits that stand in awe. Also, he has permitted us knowledge beyond our wisdom and has granted us in our unripeness the power to destroy the earth. I praise his fathomless mercy and thank him for his difficult grace. All beings perform his covenant and act out his primal law, that whatever we reap, we have sown, and what we give, we receive. To know this is the beginning of wisdom. To live it is the path of true life. Let us pray. As we simply center into that awareness of the ever-present reality that is divine spirit. The one life, the one power, the one presence that is forever and ever expressing in, through, and as all creation. 
We open our hearts in this moment. We breathe deeply into the awareness of the one life ever present, always available. We're simply sensing and feeling and knowing that there is a greater dimension, whether we call that the kingdom of heaven or some other name. We sense and know in this moment this higher order of things. We recognize our own place within it. We allow our hearts to be open to the presence of divine love, our minds to be receptive to infinite wisdom. As we live, move, and have our being in the awareness of this life as our life, we release all sense of separation. We release false beliefs, those self-imposed ideas of limitation. We recognize and know that in this presence, we are powerful, we are beautiful, we are creative. We accept our divine birthright and we call forth the truth. We call forth the presence of wholeness and allow that wholeness to reveal itself as health, as well-being, as vitality. We speak the word of love, knowing that it heals and transforms our own heart. We find it easy to forgive and to be forgiven to release and to let go. We allow our relationships to be healed and transformed through the power of unconditional love. We know that right here, right now, we are abundant beings, that we live in the presence of an infinite flow of good. And so graciously we give and generously we receive a divine bounty. We are blessed. And because we are blessed, we extend a blessing. We bless this spiritual community, this divine idea unfolding. We know that we are a light of truth, touching, healing lives, transforming the consciousness of the world. We extend a blessing to our brothers and sisters our brothers and sisters, which knows no boundaries, for everyone is our brother or our sister in the family of the divine. And so we are holding the high watch for a planet at peace, for a world that works for all, where love and peace and justice is the order of the day. I give thanks for this inner realization. I take a moment to bless all priests, all rabbis, all ministers, all teachers of every faith, for we know there are many pathways to the divine. So we honor and celebrate the progression of thought towards a unified whole, where we honor our differences, celebrate our commonality. How good it is to bear witness to this truth. And so we give thanks for this inner realization. We give thanks for its perfect demonstration, releasing this word into that law of mind, knowing that it is already established. We simply allow it to be so. With a grateful heart, together we say, and so it is. <laughs>